Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the National Constitution Center. I am Jeffrey Rosen. I am the president and CEO of this wonderful institution. Uh, the National Constitution Center, for those of you who have not been here before, uh, is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the US Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. And when representatives from Norway came to me a few months ago and suggested that the National Constitution Center and the uh, Philadelphia chapter of the Norwegian American Chamber of Commerce co-sponsor a conversation about the 200th anniversary of the Norwegian Constitution, I was absolutely thrilled because there is no constitution uh, that bears a closer similarity to the American one or has more direct influences uh, by the American framers, in particular James Madison, than the Norwegian Constitution. So this is a great uh, event to celebrate uh, the 200th anniversary of the Norwegian Constitution and also a great opportunity to examine similarities and differences between our two enduring documents of freedom, uh, which began uh, with some strong similarities, then diverged as they evolved and more recently have come to converge again. So I think this is central to the Constitution Center's mission and I'm honored uh, to moderate a panel with such distinguished panelists. I will introduce them in a moment, but I just wanna say uh, I hope you've had a chance to look at the beautiful exhibit in the lobbies uh, outside, uh, which is presented in conjunction with today's conversation and uh, represents art that is collected in this beautiful book, Red, White, and Blue, Norwegian Constitution, American Inspiration. They're really stunning pieces that are inspired uh, by provisions of the Norwegian Constitution done by Norway's finest artists. And uh, both the book and the exhibition are memorable. Uh, we have some upcoming town hall events that are related to the theme of tonight's program. On October 30th, we're thrilled to host two public programs on the constitutional legacy of James Madison. And we have superb scholars like Bert Newborn and David Stewart and federal judges from around the country, including judges Diane Wood and Kent Jordan, who will come to the Constitution Center to discuss Madison's legacy. Now our conversation will be informed by uh, today's panel. And we also have wonderful programs coming up uh, with Richard Norton Smith uh, on his acclaimed biography of Nelson Rockefeller and a debate about whether the Supreme Court is objective. Uh, please jot down your questions on note cards and, and people will uh, pick them up and we'll, we'll take them after we've begun. And uh, we're gonna have a conversation uh, for a bit and then we'll uh, welcome your questions. Uh, finally, and in the spirit of uh, both of our constitutions, it's very important to silence your cell phones and not doing so would be unconstitutional. So thank you for, for that. Now let me uh, introduce our two uh, very, very distinguished guests. Uh, we have uh, Ola Meistad, who is a, uh, a Juris Doctor and Professor at the Center for European Law at the University of Oslo. He's been a partner in the law firm uh, BAHR for many years, and he's currently working in, with international economic law uh, as it relates to EU law. And Karu Strom is the distinguished professor of politica, political silence, science at UC San Diego. He's the author of several books, including Minority Government and Majority Rule, Coalition Governments in Western Europe, and Delegation and Accountability in Parliamentary Democracies. He is a fellow of the Norwegian Academy of Arts and Sciences and a fellow of the Royal Norwegian Society and Arts and Letters. Uh, Ola, I want to begin with you. You have a great essay in this book describing how central Madison's influence was on the Norwegian Constitution. Tell us how the Norwegian Constitutions were familiar with Madison and how specifically he influenced the drafting of the document. Yes, uh, or I have a, an essay not specifically addressing Madison because Kåre is addressing Madison specifically. I'm addressing more the general issues. Uh, but they knew, uh, and that's very fascinating, they knew from the 1770s, 1780s and onwards about the development in, the, uh, in North America, as they called it at the time. And why was that? I think it was very interesting. They saw this as a European development. They also wrote about, about the North American colonies as part of Europe. And uh, the Declaration of Independence was followed in Copenhagen in the newspapers, was referred to. But what they left out, which is fascinating, is all the accusations about what George III had done to the colonies because that would offend 
the Danish Norwegian king as well, of course, if they really listed what he had been doing. So they quoted the start and the end of the Declaration of Independence. And then America was sort of a land of freedom followed. Uh, so they followed in their, uh, in their journals, they followed then the development at the convention here, for example. And they, the Norwegians had two heroes. And those heroes, they were General Washington and Dr. Franklin. That, that's the way they talked about them. They were really, the, and they said, these guys, especially the, uh, the moderation of, uh, of um, George Washington would be sort of really what made it into a success story. I think that's basically the, Im the idea they had at the time. Wonderful, that's a great uh, introduction. And you remind us that it wasn't just Madison, but Washington and Franklin as well, who inspired the Norwegian framers. Uh, tell us, Karu, Madison in particular was an influence. How were they familiar with his writings and how was it reflected in the document that they wrote? Well, Madison's work was known, of course, from the, from the Constitution itself, such as it emerged. Um, and uh, it, they were particularly uh, two f framers of the Norwegian Constitution that borrowed a lot from his ideas. Uh, Falsen and Adler were, uh, and, and they, and Falsen was probably the Norwegian equivalent of Madison and in, in the influence he had in, in sort of framing the Norwegian Constitution. And he was very much influenced by Madison's uh, ideas and by the U.S. Constitution. Um, the, the Norwegian framers also had a lot of other American writings and, and state constitutions, for example, at their disposal that, that also influenced them. But uh, probably Madison's biggest uh, influence on the Norwegian constitution had to do with the design of what was for the Norwegians the most important branch of government, namely the, the parliament or the legislature. Uh, what specific rights the legislature should have, how it should be structured, um, how it should be elected, uh, who, who would be uh, eligible for vote f to vote for it, how popular sovereignty was to ex be expressed uh, through the Norwegian Storting, the, the Norwegian Parliament. And then, uh, of course, there were other sort of overarching ideas that, that were very important, uh, uh, such as the ideas of checks and balances that we commonly associated with Madison. That was important for the Norwegian framers. And, and, and finally, I would say the Bill of Rights that Madison helped write for the U.S. Constitution also was very important for the Norwegian version. The Norwegian Constitution didn't have the same exact catalog of rights, but many of the ideas in this kind of specific, pragmatic formulation of a Bill of Rights that was also adopted from the U.S. Constitution. That's great, and that is a wonderful uh, summary. Uh, I, as, as I mentioned, we are about to display one of the 12 original copies of the Bill of Rights in a beautiful gallery that we've uh, created. And what I'd like to do is compare some of the language in the Norwegian equivalent of a Bill of Rights with ours. Uh, uh, this uh, begins, the section on human rights begins around Article 92, and it includes uh, provisions that look like our due process clause. No person may be taken into custody or deprived of liberty except in cases determined by law. Uh, everyone has a right to an independent and impartial court within reasonable time. There's a prohibition on being held in slavery, which anticipated our 13th Amendment, was, but was adopted earlier. Uh, that's newer. Oh, oh, when was that adopted? No, that's, that's very new because in 1814, slavery was abolished anyway. So, uh, in Denmark, Norway. So we added it as a part of a newer development on human rights, just to demonstrate that it stills, still is valid. But, but uh, Denmark, um, Norway was the first country before Britain banned slavery. Uh, Denmark, Norway did, uh, had already done it. So, so that, was not, that wasn't needed in the constitution at the time. So that's newer. Fascinating. How, what's the procedure for amendment? And are these uh, provisions chronological as they are in the American Bill of Rights, which is followed by subsequent amendments, or were they inserted uh, in different orders? They are inserted in different orders, so it's impo not impossible to follow the development of course, but you really have to check it. Because yeah. the amendment procedure is, it's easier to amend Norwegian constitution than the US constitution since we don't have a federal system. So uh, in Norway, you have to propose a, um, um, a change, an amendment to the constitution 
in one period of, of, of the parliament and then there will be a, a general election. There has to be a general election before parliament can vote on it. And the whole idea is, of course, the popular sovereignty that the people should get the opportunity so, to look at the proposed changes to the, uh, to the constitution and sort of vote for those candidates who will support or go against what they feel themselves. This has never been realistic, of course, but, uh, but formally that's the way we do it. And then it has to be adopted by two thirds majority. Fascinating. Uh, tell us about the role of judicial review, namely the power of courts to strike down unconstitutional laws. Were, were these rights litigated in court? And how much does the Norwegian system of judicial review resemble the American one? The Norwegian system resembles the American one probably more than just about any other country that has a constitution going back as far as, as, as the Norwegian does into the beginning of the 19th century. Um, but just like in the American Constitution, this was not an issue that was at the forefront of the discussions at the Constitutional Assembly. Um, but it was something that emerged, and, and, and it, it was a right, just like uh, the US Supreme Court asserted its right to judicial review, it was a right that was, was, was implicit in the Norwegian Constitution, and that was asserted by Norwegian courts um, and Ola may know this better than I do, but I would say the 1860s, 1870s, you have a sort of a, 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 a gradual assertion of, of these rights. Um, during the interwar period, from about the 1920s to about the 1970s, the courts gradually shrank away from, 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 uh, uh, from striking down um, executive actions and, 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 and legislation. Uh, but there's certainly been a, a, a remarkable uh, reassertion of that uh, judicial power in Norway over the last few decades. Why did it come back? I think this is part of a broader tendency towards a firmer establishment of, uh, of uh, uh, and, and protection of individual rights. Uh, some of the first decisions had to do with, uh, with protection of property rights against government encroachment. Um, there have also been uh, cases that have had to do with the individual human rights protection. Uh, and, 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 and so I, I think it's part of a broader national and international uh, trend towards uh, a sort of a, a firmer establishment of, 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 a, uh, of a set of rights. Uh, but I think it's also part of a broader um, sort of return to the ideas of, of, of checks and balances that I mentioned before that's been going on in Norway. There was a period in, in Norway, I would say, um, maybe reaching its, its, its peak in the 1950s, when the executive really was the dominant branch in Norwegian politics and there were relatively few judicial checks and, and parliament itself. Uh, did not assert its 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 power vis-a-vis -vis the executive in in, in a way that uh, that it's been prone to do since that time, but since about the 1950s, we've seen a reassertion of the power of parliament, and a reassertion of the certainly of the powers of the, the judiciary, and 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 sort of re, uh, revitalization of this conception of checks and balances, which I think has made Norway more Madisonian and more like the United States in that respect. Interesting. Um, Ola, how important was the fact that the document was written in Norwegian constitutional culture? You had t told me a moment ago that uh, farmers in the 19th century would hold pocket constitutions, and I never leave home without my pocket constitution <laughs> from the National <laughs> Constitution Center, and I hope you'll pick one up and carry yours with you always. But I was so struck that uh, the Norwegian people did the same thing. Did they refer to it in popular debate? And did that influence the political culture in a profound way? I think it absolutely did. And, and it's uh, true that they had these nice pocket uh, copies of the constitution, especially the farmers who were elected uh, to the parliament, to the storting, because the suffrage, the right to vote uh, in 1814 was about 45% of the male population, about 25 years old, would have the right to vote. 
but very many of them did not vote, but that's a very wide, it was the widest suffrage in Europe. And that meant that many farmers, including tenant farmers, could be elected. You didn't even have to be a landowner. And they felt that this was really, this was stated in the constitution, this right to vote. And so this was really their basis. And they argued uh, vehemently based on that constitution. Uh, and also a nice caricatures where they said the constitution is the farmer's weapon against the king, mm. for example, so, mm -hmm. which was true in a way. Um, yeah. But so, so it was really, there was a constitutional culture, not the, the first years, I think here's this parallel uh, with, um, with the, uh, the American development because after 1814, then the Napoleonic Wars were over and it was an enormous economic crisis in, um, in Europe, in, including Norway. So then people sort of thought, well, what we really need is uh, trade and, and uh, be able to sell our products. This constitution thing is not so important. So there were even rumors that some farmers wanted to have a stronger royal power back because then they could appeal to the king. But then in the, from the very early, some farmers all the time, even in 1814 itself, and then 1820s, 1830s, the farmers really saw this as their protection. Or when I call them farmers, that's typically because everyone who lived in the countries, I was sort of a farmer. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> yes, so it was really, it was the people's document. In that yes, time. it was absolutely the people's document. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, uh, and that lasted maybe basically till maybe after 1905 or around that period. But then came, when, with, uh, with the rise of the labor movement, laborers, manual laborers, did not have the right to vote. So they were very divided on the relationship to the constitution. Is it protecting us or isn't it? Is it excluding us? But some labor representatives, they said, the idea of the constitution is democratic, should just widen the suffrage. Uh, others said that, no, this is sort of an instrument of oppression since we are excluded. But, and then basically in the 1930s, also the labor movement sort of came over to the constitutional side because then they, the suffrage was widened and they got over on the road to get majority in parliament. Then of course you get much more parliamentarian. But I think that all through the nine, nearly all through the 19th century, the constitution was really seen as uh, an instrument of the people itself, and then meaning not the upper classes, but the really working people. Very Madisonian indeed, and you remind us that this, the central essence of constitutionalism is limitations on government. Uh, you also remind us though that in Norway, as in America, not all of the people were originally included in the constitution, and the story of the laborers uh, as opposed to the farmers is instructive. I gather there are other provisions of the Norwegian constitution that were initially less liberal, if you will, than they are now, as, as in the American constitution, which of course was tainted by slavery and the exclusion of uh, women from the suffrage uh, at the outset. Article two now says our values will remain Christian, will, our values will remain our Christian and, human, and humanist heritage, but I gather that um, Initially, Jews and Jesuits and Catholics were blocked from Norway entirely. Tell us about that story of religious exclusion yeah. and how it came to be effaced. That, 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 it's it's uh, interesting and, 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 and sad story. And, and I think it, it, there's a sort of a, a Madisonian lesson to it because I think this is one example of, of, of the passions in a, in a Madisonian sense, overcoming an assembly that otherwise made a lot of wise decisions, namely the Constitutional Assembly, the 112 members that assembled at Aidsvold in 1814 to give Norway constitution. They started out with an agenda uh, set by their constitution committee, sort of the, the smaller const committee that prepared the agenda for, for, uh, for, the, for the assembly, that said that they would work towards religious tolerance. Uh, but when it came to the design of this Article 2, what became Article 2 in the Constitution, it ended up, um, and, and I think largely because of debates that were taking place uh, or that sort of inf inflamed the passions, to use Madisonian language, uh, excluding a number of religious groups from Norway. So it wasn't just 
that Norway ended up with an established church, but it ended up with less than full religious tolerance in 1849. I think most people wanted an established Lutheran church, uh, but, but there was certainly a debate about religious tolerance. And, and the Constitution ended up excluding uh, Jews and excluding and prohibiting Jews and, and Catholic orders uh, from, uh, from, from the country, excluding them from the country. And this pretty much directly after the, uh, after the Constitution was signed, people started having second thoughts about this. And there was a big social debate about the, about the fairness of, of these exclusionary uh, articles. And, and eventually they were overturned. So in the 1850s, Jews were allowed into Norway. But it actually took close to 150 years uh, before Jesuits were allowed to, to, to live and operate in Norway, which is kind of remarkable. It was not until the 1950s wow. that the last part of that, uh, of that article was, was uh, repealed. Uh, so so in, in some ways, I think the Norwegian constitution was a remarkably uh, egalitarian and inclusive document. In some ways, it wasn't as liberal as it was uh, egalitarian. And, and I think this is probably the most egregious example of, of, of ways in, it, in which it was, it was uh, uh, less liberal and, and, and I would say less Madisonian since you, the First Amendment is certainly one of his major contributions to the U.S. constitutional tradition. Um, so in that sense, this is one area where, where the Norwegian Constitution uh, really diverged from, 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 uh, from the American one. You're right that Madison's notions of religious tolerance reflected in the ban on test, religious test oaths for offices was uh, distinctly liberal, but we do have these uh, illiberal elements, the exclusion of women and African Americans mm, that took certainly. a similarly long amount of time to, to remedy. Um, Ola, tell us about the relationship between the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution in Norway. Yes, because you know, here in the US you were sort of very, there was a long time span between the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, 1776, 1787. Norway, of course, was really in a rush because this was Napoleonic Wars ending and the great powers, the Allies, had said to Sweden, if you support us in the fight against France, Napoleonic France, then we will support you in taking Norway. That was basically the deal. Then, uh, in, um, then Napoleon lost around, uh, around Christmas um, 1814. He came back afterwards, but I uh, can't go into the details. But then, um, so that Denmark had lost, Denmark signed a treaty and saying that, uh, okay, we transfer Norway to the king of Sweden. But the Swedish army, they were on the continent fighting Napoleon. So that's when the Norwegians said, okay, we really have some open space here, which we can use. So they convened and then they declared independence on the, 17th, the 19th of February and sent it out to all countries, a translation, we want peace with everyone, we are free and independent, the people have sworn an oath to defend the independence in the churches and we are calling for a constitutional assembly to meet in April. So they, which it did in April and then wrote the constitution basically uh, till the 17th of May when it was formally signed. People had written drafts before, but anyway, it was very efficient. So, the Declaration of Independence in, in February and then the Constitution already in May, and still the Swedish army had not arrived uh, in the north. So then we elected a king and everything. But what we then did uh, in, the, in the Constitution itself was that the Declaration of Independence from, uh, from February was sort of written into Article 1 of the Constitution. So that it starts out with a declaration that Norway is a free and independent um, uh, country was sort of the first words of, of Article 1. And that was really referring back to what had been stated in February. Um, and since things went so fast, I mean, people knew that when they went to church to swear this oath uh, about independence, they didn't know what expected them. I think very few knew the, uh, the, the priests have been instructed to do this, but for the people, I think in general, they just uh, went to church like they were supposed to do. And then suddenly they were sort of told to swear 
um, an oath to independence, and that's very rare because the oaths in the old European monarchies, they would always be to the king. Mm. And that had been the draft idea uh, uh, that we should just declare a new monarchy and the people should swear an oath to the king. But uh, a very important piece of Norwegian de development is that it's really the people who has the power, the idea that the people has the power. Because when the prince who was the governor at the time was sort of running the country, he said that, well, I have a right of inheritance to become a king. And he met with 21 highly ranked members of society to sort of discuss how do we do this. And then 19 of them said, you don't have any right. Because uh, the, the old king, uh, Danish Norwegian old king, he has now uh, freed us from our old oath to that king. And that means under natural law, that we are a free people again, free to establish our own form of government. That's explicitly what they say. And then the governor, he rewrites this declaration and says, okay, the Norwegian people given back its free right to choose its form of government, hereby declares independence. This is fascinating. Uh, and it goes to the core of the notion of popular sovereignty in the Constitution and Declaration. And I wanna ask you, uh, some more about it, Koru. So as uh, Ola said, the Article 1 says, the Kingdom of Norway is a free, independent, indivisible, and inalienable realm. Its form of government is a limited and hereditary monarchy. monarchy. That language of an inalienability, of course, is found in the U.S. Declaration of Independence, which, drawing on the same natural law theory that Ola mentioned, held that people are born with certain natural and unalienable and God-given rights, uh, the chief one is the right to alter and abolish government when it becomes subversive of liberty, and that they retain the, the power, popular sovereignty, uh, and cannot alienate that to any government. It sounds like the Norwegian notion of popular sovereignty is a little bit different. Uh, you, you elect a king, but yet the people retain ultimate power. Compare and contrast, if you will, the Norwegian and U.S. notions of popular sovereignty reflected in this preamble. Well, the Norwegian constitution, as you mentioned, clearly had to deal with the fact that Norway had been and, 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 and would remain a monarchy. Um, but it had been technically an absolute monarchy up until, uh, up until 1814 and, and, uh, and when, they, um, when, his, when the uh, Danish king abdicated his rights as, as king of Norway. Um, and so that's, uh, that's, that's where it was coming from. Um, and, and, and what the Norwegian Constitutional Assembly was trying to do it was to sort of stake out a ground where they would continue to have a monarch because there was really no alternative to that. Um, and at the same time, insist on the idea of popular sovereignty that, that you know, the king was there as a representative of the people. Um, and, and this was different from other, there were constitutional monarchs elsewhere in Europe at this time, and Sweden was one example. And, but Sweden has a, had a constitution that was less committed to popular sovereignty. It was more, the constitution is a contract between the king and, and the people. It's not a constitution given by, by, the, by the people itself and, and, and choosing a monarchy as a form of government. Um, but, but it's, it's, but it's also important to note that whereas the U.S. Constitution and, and, and the idea of popular sovereignty ultimately meant that the, all the different branches of government would be, would be accountable to the people in some direct or indirect way. And, the, and there were certainly many different mechanisms by which that was designed in the U.S. Constitution. Uh, the Norwegian constitution because of the monarchy would be a little different from that. And, and that's why I said at the beginning uh, that the influence on the design of parliament was really critical. Both, I mean, and this is where the American and Madisonian influence was, was very strong. Uh, and, and part of the reason that that was so critical was that, that the parliament really was the branch of government that was directly elected by and accountable to the people in a way that the monarchy couldn't, could not technically be, uh, and and so, and, and so the, and eventually 
in the 1880s when Norway transitioned into parliamentary democracy, what happened was effectively that the, that the parliament asserted its right as the, as the sort of, a, as the um, voice of the people, as the form that, that, that the voice of the people would take, and, uh, and, and that it forced um, it forced the king to give up his, his power to personally so, select the members of the cabinet, and that paved the way for sort of a transition to a to a parliamentary system and, and a system where the uh, where power would would much more directly flow through parliament uh, uh, from the people through parliament. And this evolution that Karu displays uh, describes a lot resulted, I understand from your essays in the transformation of the original uh, bicameral legislature, which was taken directly from the American example, into a unicameral or single chamber legislature. Uh, tell that, us more about that's that. That's true, but I'd just like to add something to what Cora said first, because what he said is, is completely right. And, and also, uh, in 1814, when they were going sort of to establish uh, popular sovereignty and having a king at the same time. Uh, that's a bit difficult, of course. So how do you do that? Yes. But what they did, for example, and which is extremely important, is that changes to the constitution could be made without any consent by the king. So the, the, the constitution was completely in the hands of parliament. So that meant that the representative assembly really had the ultimate power. And that led uh, international commentators in the 19th century to say that Norway is truly a republic because since the king's powers rests only on a decision by parliament, he's not hereditary or by grace of God or whatever, as, um, as uh, he is in, in all other European states. And this is very important. We're talking about these two old constitutions. You know, the US and Norwegian constitution are the only surviving constitutions from the revolutionary era. Hmm. All newer constitutions after 1814 gave the power, uh, uh, gave, um, separated the power to change the constitutions between the king and an elected assembly. Hmm. So in all other countries, uh, changes to the constitution could be blocked by the king. So this is also part of uh, sort of the commonality with with the European US Constitution. So even if, if you didn't have a king, uh, it was sort of the same idea. I was only that body that was elected by the people who could really change the Constitution. And that, um, that provision uh, was very important in the discussion that Cora mentioned in the 1880s, because then really Parliament asserted that power, which was on the books all the time. But they, People would say, well, this, they can't have had enough time at Eidsvoll where they drafted the constitution because you just forgot to give the king a right to veto constitution changes. It was also the theories trying to limit the power of parliament. But then in the 1880s, it really asserted itself. And then we got um, parliamentarian uh, democracy developing afterwards. And that just continued so that. Um, uh, people may know that in, in 1905, the union with Sweden, which was br uh, negotiated uh, in, in the autumn of 1814, then was abolished again in 1905. And then we elected a new king. Um, and he wasn't given any personal powers at all. But we didn't change the wording of the constitution. We just said that the king doesn't mean the king. Hmm. The, king <laughs> the king is the government. So that's the sort of that's how lawyers read the texts, of course. <laughs> Just only yeah. a lawyer could come up with that uh, <laughs> insight. Was there an actual king uh, uh, called the king who had no powers, or was it an abstraction? No, it was an absolute king, and he was he was then um, the the person who was elected was a, a, one of the younger princes of Denmark. So he sort of went back to Denmark in a way, and then uh, uh, when. Uh, when he was elected, it was quite a harsh school uh, because uh, in the first meeting in uh, King in Council, meeting of the government, uh, the secretary asked, should I send the documents to the king? And then the prime minister said, he shall have no documents because he shouldn't see what it was all about. He should sign. And, uh, and there's another story in 1907 when the king was listening to the ministers debating. 
And then there was a dissenting opinion between the ministers, and the prime minister himself was in the minority. And the king listened to the prime minister and said, I agree with the prime minister. He thought that was quite clever, of course. Then the prime minister said, the king agrees with the majority. Because <laughs> he wasn't part of it. So that was really how the monarchy functioned from uh, 1905. And still is, in a way. But now they get the documents. Now they get the documents. So, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Maybe an email or something like that. But yeah. <laughs> a brief email. <laughs> Uh, I've, I'm learning so much from the similarities and differences, but Koto, of course, uh, the Madisonian notion was that popular sovereignty would be protected by having a separate amendment procedure, that ordinary laws passed by the legislature were subordinate to the Constitution ratified by the people themselves, and that the Congress couldn't uh, change itself or merge itself into a single body that would require a constitutional amendment. As Ola has described it, the decision to place sovereignty in parliament, which was very much of a boon for popular sovereignty, did result in the system becoming more parliamentarian and less uh, of the Madisonian system that we understand. Tell us more about that evolution. Well, there are really two important uh, years in that evolution. They're 1884 and 1905. And 1884 is when uh, members of the king's council appointed by the king himself and, and basically answerable to the king uh, were, uh, were impeached. And because the constitution in Norway set up an impeachment procedure uh, and that... Taken from the U.S.? Yes. Oh. Mm. And yes. The original constitution? Yes. Yes. Interesting. Oh. Set up an impeachment procedure which would become very important in 1884 uh, and, and the interesting thing, and, and, and it was borrowed from the United States in the sense that, uh, that, uh, that uh, the impeachment procedures would be brought by the lower division of the legislature and, the, and then the, the cabinet members who were impeached would be tried by the, by the, by the upper house or upper division. Um, but in the Norwegian case, that upper division was supplemented by the members of the Supreme Court. So it was a a sort of an interbranch uh, impeachment uh, court, um, but at that point, um, at, at, at that point, the the Liberal Party, which was in favor of parliamentary democracy, had uh, won a big electoral victory in Parliament and and was able to effectively pack uh, this impeachment court with its own members, so that they uh, so that they were in the majority of the. Of, of the court and they voted to impeach the cabinet mem members um, and the prime minister am among them um, for, uh, for, for, for basically um, ad advising the king unconstitutionally. Uh, and they had to be, and the cabinet members had to resign and from that point on effectively without any formal change in the constitution uh, and, and with a few exceptions uh, uh, that in the first few years, the cabinet members would be answerable to parliament and that met, led to a British style parliamentary system effectively instead of an American style system where uh, the party that controlled the majority of the members of the, of the parliament would also be able to indirectly appoint uh, the members of the cabinet and they would be answerable to parliament instead of being answerable to the, to the king. Uh, under the threat that you know we can always impeach you again if you you know if you start misbehaving, um, and so that was one step in the process. And the other step in the process was in 1905 when Norway seceded from the dual monarchy with Sweden, as Ola has, has mentioned, and 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 uh, these. Both of these were, of course, major constitutional changes, but they were not immediately followed by a, a formal amendment of all the constitutional provisions that would be affected. So in many ways, the constitution uh, was given a new meaning. And this, the, the, the conventions that governed the king, for example, that Ola has talked about, um, just evolved. And, 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 and it, it basically meant that the prime minister was going to lecture the king about what his proper role would be and say, look, the Constitution of, on paper may say this and that and that you have certain powers, but don't try to exercise them because in your role, uh, as it has evolved now, is, is simply that of being a, a figurehead monarch, a constitutional monarch, and, and, and do not think that you can 
personally appoint uh, people to offices such as the formal constitution says you can or that you can have a voice in, in, in cabinet decisions. So Koru mentioned a contrast between the constitution as written and the constitution as practiced. Ola, I wonder, um, the American framers debated which was more important, uh, structural protections for liberty like separation of powers and uh, the checks and balances of federalism or a written Bill of Rights. What was the case in, in Norway? What was more important for actually constraining power? What, uh, That's was a very good question, really, yeah. because it's very relevant. In, during much of the 19th century, structural uh, provisions of the Constitution were the hotly debated ones, the ones we've addressed now, they were really important. But then, after parliamentary democracy uh, is in place, then we sort of return to the uh, Bill of Rights. Uh, they had always been there and they had always been exercised, but they then become more important again. And that has, as Kora uh, mentioned, especially over the last 30 years or so, uh, been very much more important. But they have been there sort of uh, all the time. And, and that also has a special US relationship because, uh, um, as Kora said, uh, judicial review in Norway became very strong in the 1860s, but it started already in the 1820s. And I think in the 1820s, they didn't know much about what happened in the US. I think that the main point at that time was, like here, that just the, uh, the Constitution was the Supreme Court of the land, and then, of course, no ordinary legislation should violate the Constitution. And who should be the guardian of that? It had to be the Supreme Court. So I think they just applied the same logic. But then in the 1860s, uh, we know for sure that the president of the Norwegian Supreme Court, he read American cases. And he read Joseph Story's mm. book on American constitutional law because he refers to it. And that, of course, encouraged him because he saw, well, there are other civilized nations uh, who do the same thing. And it's important to remember, in this point in time, no other country in the world but Norway and the US had judicial review. Mm. Because you couldn't have it if you had a true monarchy. Because that would mean that the king's powers would be subordinated to the courts. So it's very special. Nowadays, everyone has judicial review. Mm. But that's a new development, basically, after the Second World War. And then again, after the Berlin Wall came down. But uh, I think this is really a, a child of the Norwegian and the US Constitution being revolutionary constitutions with popular sovereignty um, as sort of as the bedrock and then the constitution as the expression of that uh, uh, popular will, which then logically leads to that that has to be, that all other legislation has to be, has to respect the provisions of, uh, of the constitution. So, so we had this parallel development and, and that main part of it was also related to the Bill of Rights. So the property protection in the Bill of Rights was always important. Freedom of expression uh, should in, in some periods have been more important than it was uh, <laughs> in the sense that the court sometimes accepted governmental action, which they shouldn't in a way. And then um, uh, also the ban on retroactive legislation was also very important. And these two provisions, they are phrased exactly as they were in 1814 still, and are now in the new comeback of judicial review, very important again. So it's very much the old uh, protections which are now revived. So it's quite a fascinating story about judicial review. And still it's nothing in the constitution about judicial review. As in ours, which does not mm -hmm. explicitly recognize judicial review, although the framers clearly intended it as Federalist 78 uh, suggestion as the great case Marbury versus Madison established. Uh, Kora, um, as Ola has described it, Norway and the US have this rich tradition of first structural protections for liberty, which was then led to vigorous judicial enforcement of the Bill of Rights. Europe is now going down this road and adopting the European Parliament is adopting broad new rights, uh, courts are proposing new rights like the right to be forgotten or the droit l'oubli, which is f f uh, posing a great uh, debate about the relationship between privacy and free speech. My question is this, without the tradition, the Madisonian tradition, if you will, of 
structural protections and a Bill of Rights and popular sovereignty. Is, are the other European countries really prepared to have vigorous enforcement of a Bill of Rights, or is this a tradition that is not deeply rooted in history and may cause some problems? Well, that's a, that's a big question. <laughs> uh, but let me say that uh, even though, you know, Ula's absolutely right that Norway and and the United States really were in the forefront of both of the development of, 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 of rights and, and of, of the establishment of judicial review. Uh, there certainly is a continental uh, tradition of, of, uh, of uh, libertarianism and the specification of, of human rights. And, 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 and you know, the French Revolution certainly had its own development of those kinds of documents. And there's a British tradition of, uh, that, that, that we stand in, in some sense, and both Americans and Norwegians, you know, for, from Locke and, 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 and from the Glorious Revolution uh, of 1689. Um, so I, I wouldn't be too uh, pessimistic on, on behalf of Europe, but, uh, but I would also say there certainly have, have been substantial, large, tragic problems about human rights enforcement in the con European continent. But I think that's also given rise to very specific uh, constitutions and, and bills of rights since World War II. For example, in the German constitution is very explicit uh, in this directly, as a direct consequence of the horrible abuses that happened under, under Nazism. Um, so, and, and there certainly is a, a, a in, in, in countries that have been liberated from, uh, from, uh, from the uh, Soviet bloc, no doubt there, there are similar kinds of concerns about oppression. So I wouldn't be too pessimistic about the, the prospects for, for, uh, for that sort of a bill of rights in Europe. But I do think it's also an important issue for Norway because it's another way in which uh, Norwegian politics and, and, and Norwegian society is increasingly subject to legislation that emanates from outside of Norway. And Norway is not a member of the European Union, but Norway does have a relationship with the, uh, with the European Union through the Euro European economic area, which means that Norway really is subject to much of the same legislation that, that, uh, that the, uh, that, that uh, uh, occurs in the 28 member states of the European Union. And that's increasingly another, uh, 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 another one of these checks and balances that have become increasingly important in Norwegian politics. And it's part of the drive towards a greater um, judicial protection of, of individual rights. Part of that protection is coming, uh, is coming from international sources. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and, uh, and, and uh, Norwegian politics is increasingly the same kind of multi-level uh, multi governance that we find in the United States. In 1814, Norway was a simpler country in the sense there were no pre-existing states. There was no federalism to be concerned about. Um, but today, Norway is really embedded in a international system and in a relationship to other countries in Europe particularly that is much more uh, that, it, that is much more meaningful and, and constraining than, uh, than, uh, than it was just a few decades ago. A great answer to a large uh, question. Uh, we now have some excellent uh, questions from the audience. Uh, here's the first one. Can you speak to the state of the effect of popular sovereignty as now in Norway as it relates to the formation of legislation, especially around policy and trade? Ola, what do you think of that one? Uh, that's a difficult question, which we thought about now because of the bicentennial. Since the, since the, um, since popular sovereignty was so important in 1814, we're sort of thinking about how is it now? Uh, and then, of course, countries like Norway is very heavily bound in with European developments and also international developments, uh, with treaties. Of course, all treaties that Norway enter into are voted upon in Parliament. So in that sense, <laughs> they are based on popular sovereignty. They are accepted. But then, of course, what happens is that treaties get their own, a life of their own, uh, with uh, treaty bodies who develop the jurisprudence, for example, uh, or uh, other countries, parties to the treaty, 
uh, who sort of interpret the treaty differently and put pressure on. So, so in one sense, um, popular sovereignty is much more restricted, although the franchise is as wide as it could get, for example. But popular sovereignty in that sense is much more restricted since it's an interconnected world through legal means, legal instruments. Mm. Very interesting. Um, Koda, are there any recognized Norwegian founding fathers? Do you have a Washington or Franklin parallel? Uh, no, probably nobody who stands out in, 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 in sort of uh, in, in Norwegian history quite as much as the founders of the United States. And that is partly because several of these founders later beca became presidents of the United States and, 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 and made significant contributions and, and, and are famous in part because of that. Um, but there were, uh, there were prominent people uh, among the Norwegian founders. I, I mentioned, I, I believe, Falsen, Christian Magnus Falsen, who probably was the most Madison-like uh, uh, framer of the Norwegian constitution. He was, one of the, uh, he was one of the authors of one of the constitutional drafts. The Constitutional Assembly had a whole set of con draft constitutions at its, at its disposal when it started deliberating. And the most influential one was the one that Falsen drafted. He didn't get his way on all issues. He didn't get, he wanted a bicameral legislature much like the US and he didn't quite get that. But in, in lots of ways he had more influence on, on the constitution than probably just about anybody else. Um, uh, there was, uh, there were other people like for example, uh, Nikolai Vergon, who was the father of the Norwegian poet that many of you may have heard about. Uh, um, and, uh, and, 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 and he was probably responsible for better or worse for the, the sort of illiberal parts of Article <laughs> 2 of the Norwegian Constitution. Um, and, and, and there were a number of other, uh, other luminaries in, in, in that constitutional assembly, but of course since Norway didn't have a presidential system, no, nobody became president. And in fact, none of these, uh, none of these characters uh, became, for example, uh, as far as I know, and Ola, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't remember them being prominent cabinet ministers after eight, 1814. Um, one of them, Vedl Jarlsberg, continued to play an important role in politics, but he was often on the losing side of the battles that were going on, or the battles, or the debates that were going on at the Constitutional Assembly in 1814. So if I had to pick one person, I'd say Falsen was hmm. the, the, the main architect. Could I support the choice Please. of Falsen? Because Falsen is really important, and it's even more important that many think he wrote the most important draft. And what is really important, he started writing it while the Danish prince still thought he should declare himself as an absolute king. So Falsen sort of started the whole race towards the constitution. Then uh, at Eidsvoll, at the Constitutional Assembly, he was chairing the committee which really drafted the constitution and they, were, they actually worked on a printed version of his own draft. That's how they worked. But he was flexible because he had about 220 uh, articles in his draft, and uh, they ended up with 110. So he's obviously a leader who could listen to, uh, to others. And then he was also partly president of the whole Constitutional Assembly in the most important week. And they said that he made us work like animals. Because hmm. he really put pressure, because he knew the time constraints. Hmm. So, and I think that's why he sort of gave up on some of his own ideas, for example. Because um, he just wanted to push this through. And he has an American link, you know, he ha had a son in, in 1814, who was baptized on the 19th of May, I think. And what did he call him? George Benjamin. Ma oh, magnificent, <laughs> superb. <laughs> I knew we picked the right country to celebrate our ties with. <laughs> that is absolutely great. Um, well, we need some American presidents naming their kids after Falson, and we'll be, we'll be in good shape. Uh, we have time for one more question. Uh, when did women achieve the right to vote in Norway? Is a statement affirming equal rights codified in the Constitution, unlike our failed equal rights amendment in the US? 
We now have equal rights on the Constitution, but we didn't have that, and then we didn't actually have equal rights either, of course. There was a strong tendency of equality, uh, but not based on, on sex in 1814. It was because we abolished a nobility in the Constitution, no future nobility, and we said there's a general cons conscription, even son of the count should be uh, do military service. So there was uh, equality between men. But, uh, but then the general suffrage for women, that was 1913, so it was 100 years ago, last year. But there was some development on, human, on uh, women's suffrage before that, so the wealthy women uh, would have the right to it maybe 98 or something. I uh, mm. can't remember, they were sort of testing it. But there was one draft at the Constitutional Assembly which said that women should have the right to vote, but that wasn't even discussed. Uh, I think that, but there was an argument in favor of it. They said that women can run businesses. Typically a widow would continue the business. Why shouldn't she then be able also to point to who are the best men to govern us? Mm. That was the argument. Mm. But, uh, but there's no trace of any discussion on that at all at Daisel. And it may even be that, uh, that uh, it wasn't distributed to the whole uh, assembly. We don't know that for sure. Uh, well, we have the draft, uh, and it's a clever draft, but it's sort of, okay, he can't really mean that, or whatever. That was written by a Danish nobleman, so he was not one of those taking part in the, in the discussions. Can I, can I just follow please up do. on yeah, that? Please, do. please and do the last one. Some of the rationale that it was at least given afterwards for excluding women from the suffrage was the same rationale that was given for excluding most men from having the right to vote, that, that they, they didn't have and couldn't have independent property. And married women, of course, could not, could not, uh, uh, we did not have the same kind of property rights as men did in the early 19th century. Um, so, so, so yes, it was exclusionary, and it took a while before uh, demands for women's rights really took off. But after the, uh, after the, um, dissolution of the dual monarchy with Sweden in 1905, it was really more or less a foregone conclusion that the franchise would be extended to women, and it happened in 1913. That was partly a consequence of the fact that the constitutional amendment process required an election to take place before the constitutional amendment could happen. So you could say, when Norway became independent of Sweden and the dual monarchy ended in 1905, that set in that, that sort of set in motion the process that led to first, well, actually, we already had full adult suffrage for men, but, but then uh, first a qualified suffrage for, for, for wealthier women, and then finally, 1913, uh, full adult suffrage for, for women as well. Well, in that sense, you beat us by seven years. We ratified our 19th Amendment granting women suffrage in 1920, but it sounds like there was great similarity in the linkage of the suffrage to property and also in the exclusion of women from owning property, of course, in the 19th century. This has been a wonderfully substantive discussion and I've learned so much from the similarities and differences. It is inspiring that we, two great countries, share this common tradition of written constitutionalism, uh, which has led us uh, to protect liberties and popular sovereignty so vigorously and this is precisely the kind of comparative debate that uh, I'm so proud to host at the National Constitution Center. I hope you'll come online to visit our new interactive, which will allow you to click on any provision of the American Bill of Rights and trace the spread of that liberty across the globe. So you'll be able to go to the Norwegian, uh, to, to Norway, and see which provisions were adopted from America and which were not, and to compare the text. And you can do that for any country in the world. In the enthusiasm of my initial introduction, I neglected to thank our sponsors and honored guests, and I'm gonna do that uh, now. Uh, as I said, this is a product of a special partnership with the Philadelphia chapter of the Norwegian American Chamber of Commerce, the Global Philadelphia Association, and the Norwegian Consulate General in New York. And we're so honored to have with us today, Eileen Birgit Rongli, who is Consul General of Norway in New York, Eric Tropp, who is Honorary Norwegian Council in Philadelphia, and Trond Olsen, who has been the initiator and driving force behind this initiative. Trond, it was your great idea to bring us together, and I'm so glad this has come off so well. Finally, I want to thank Froda 
Chirsum from the chamber and also my great colleague, Renee Julian from the Constitution Center who oversaw this project so well. Um, please come downstairs uh, where this beautiful book will be on sale in the bookstore. Please enjoy the lovely and inspiring paintings that are displayed on this floor and downstairs. And please allow me to uh, welcome an honored guest who will thank you as well. Thank you, Tron. I'll, I'll come stand next to you. It's so great to see you. Nice to see you. <clears throat> it will take some time. <laughs> it's worth it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, my name is Trond B. Olsen, and, uh, and uh, I'm the man behind the project 1814-2014, Red, White, and Blue, Norwegian Constitution, American Inspiration. I felt that I should uh, tell you a little bit about the project, which started in 2006. That year, we marked that it was 100 years since our great poet, Henry Gibson, passed away. In that connection, I made a book and an art exhibition where six Norwegian contemporary artists made 36 pieces of art, which was exhibited in Seattle, San Diego, Houston, Minneapolis, and Washington, DC. It was at that time I presented the idea to this project to former Norwegian ambassador Knud Wolbeck that say, go for it. And here we are today. Um, I wanted to make a project that was based upon similarity and freedom for 200 years, Norway and US shared heritage, different experiences. At that time, the key words in my project was right of life, right of speech, suffrage, religious freedom, due process of law. Our aims were to create attention around the two constitutions and their similarities, differences, Consciousness about the consequences the two constitutions have for the population of the specific countries and to create discussions. The book explains how the Norwegian constitution was created, how it has functioned, and the democratic challenges it faces. The book also examines how the American constitution has influenced the Norwegian constitution. The book is directed toward a wide range of readers especially students in all levels. The art produced by 10 Norwegian contemporary artists in connection with this project is not intended uh, to illustrate the text. This is not a review of the statutory text section by section. Art offers an opportunity to add essential dimensions to the apprehension of issues, relationships and discussions and this is the point of departure for the project. There are so many to thank for being here today with the book and with the exhibition. The Consulate General in New York by their Consul General, Elin Bergitte Rongli and Martin Fossum. Norwegian American Chamber of Commerce by their leader, Frode Kjersum. The National Constitution Center by René Julian, Stephanie Ryer, Bethan Wye, Lina Kalusher and Stephanie Wiener. At the end of February this year, I was to meet with the president and CEO of the National Constitution Center. I knew nothing about him up front, but I was looking forward to an interesting meeting. Dear Jeffrey, you are more or less the reason why we are here today with the book and the exhibition. In our meeting, you immediately expressed such a positive attitude to the project, so as I must say, uh, taken on the bed, as we say in Norway. <laughs> you accepted to join the project, and you accepted to go for book presentation and art exhibition as far as costs were covered up. Thanks again to Elin Birgitte Rongli and her staff in uh, New York City. Our strong connections between our nations are worthful. 
Norway has received and used much of the material from your constitution. I do, do, I do not know what Norway has paid in return. I'm not representing the, Nor the, Nor the, the formal, uh, the official Norway, but I want you to receive on behalf of uh, um, uh, the NAC, the Consulate General New York, and myself, a memory of our bicentral. What is more Norwegian than the two graphic works and a numbered leather book signed by the two artists, Inge Sitter and Sverre Bjertnes, and by all the authors, yourself included. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I do hope that you will find a suitable um, place for the Arctic work uh, in your beautiful center. And uh, when you pass by them, you should know how thankful we are to your nation and to your center. So here we are. Thank you so much. Congratulations on this wonderful book. I'm so glad we did this together. Great. Thank you. Thank you for paying attention Thank to you me. so much, Tonda. And ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our wonderful panelists, Ola and Karu. Thank you. Great. Look forward to seeing you outside. Thanks again for a great program.